that you can't figure out what we're going to be talking about this morning. I figured since we're talking about the subject of Bible class, it would make sense for me to preach from the Bible class area just to kind of keep in with the theme. I've already queried with Howard and Joyce the front row here. They know that I tend to spit, so they know that that's coming. They have a quick rain shield appropriately. I appreciate Brad leading us those songs, tailoring the songs around the idea of the Bible and Bible class and the study of it. Appreciate that song service. It leads us very well into what we're going to be talking about. I would encourage you, though, to open up in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy 6 is a favorite passage, is a keynote passage of what we're going to be discussing this morning. We'll get into it in just a second. And I've, I've had a lot of questions leading up to it ever since we posted a few weeks ago that we were going to be discussing the concept of Bible class. That I have had people ask me, and we're going to be discussing the authority behind Bible class. The answer to that is no. We discussed the authority of Bible class last year during our yearly theme. If you remember, I think it was sometime around May, June, July. So if you do go onto our website, you'll see that, that lesson there about the authority of Bible class. The other question is, why are we even discussing it? It's one of those things that just seems to be natural, that we can just talk about, that we can study. So why is it that it's even brought up in the first place? And I'll tell you the reason for the why we're discussing it in Bible, or the concept of Bible class, the necessity and the urgency of discussing Bible class it's because every single place I've ever been, every place I've ever been a member of, whether that's Amarillo, whether that's East Texas and Lufkin and Nag, or even here sometimes, I've noticed that there are almost always two groups of people. There are people that are here every time the doors are open. Every time those doors open up, they're right in through there. They're sitting front row. They're answering questions. There are people that are here every single time. And there are other people, for a variety of reasons, who are here only really for worship service. And so, if you're one of those people here that's only been here for worship service, you may think that I'm addressing you directly. I'm not. It's kind of a general issue that I've seen just overall throughout my time walking this earth the 32 years that I've been alive so far. And there's people that come for a variety of reasons. The people who only show up for worship service on Sunday mornings, not even Wednesday nights, but just Sunday mornings, it happens for a variety of reasons. And I hear very similar reasons. We don't have time to go into all those right now. But it ranges anywhere from I have work, to I'm sick, or we just can't for whatever reason. And so the reasons for why people don't come to Bible class are just about as varied as they come. But I'll tell you right now, there's not a soul present on this earth that cannot benefit from Bible study. There's not a person living on this earth that views, and rightfully so, Bible class, that 45 minutes that we have together twice a week, views that as insignificant. Everybody needs Bible class. If it's not with me, it's with somebody. Everybody needs Bible class. And so when we talk about the aspect of Bible class, it's one of those things that should not be overlooked. And on a personal note, I tell you, whenever you know, I come on Wednesday nights or we come on Sundays and we have 30, 40 percent attendance, which isn't very common, but when those days come, I'll be honest with you, it affects me. I try not to let it affect me visibly because it's not about me, but it is hard not to take that personally. And extending that even farther back in the Bible class area, it's hard for a teacher who's teaching eight kids that are all under the age of five, who's prepared all week and has prepared for seven kids to show up on Sunday morning and only see two. It's hard not to take that personally. And then extending that even further, it's hard to then go to other Bible class teachers and say, look, would you be willing to teach this class when the class has had about 10% attendance in the five years leading up to it? It's hard to convince people to teach if that's the case. <laughs> but at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, Bible class is not about me. It's not about my ego. It's not about anything that's personal towards me. It's because I understand, as everybody here does, that Bible class is fundamental and foundational to our growth as a Christian. We're talking about it this morning, ladies and gentlemen, because I see and you know and you see how important it is for your life. When you look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, you can't help but be impressed by what Jesus or by what God has to say. In the book of Deuteronomy, whenever Moses is preaching what essentially would be his last sermon to the nation of Israel, he has something to say here in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that talks about the inundation of Scripture in our lives. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 4, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I have commanded you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your head, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. The Jews took this very literally, by the way. Verse 9, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The point that Moses is driving towards in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is God's word needs to be everywhere. Not necessarily literal. You don't have to have the verses of Matthew inscribed upon your doorpost, or you don't have to have a pocket of verses just cemented to your forehead. That's not necessarily what he's going towards. But what Moses is saying here in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is Bible scripture and Bible study, the wisdom of God, needs to be omnipresent in your life. If you're not studying it, we should be thinking about it. 
If we're not reading it, we should be dwelling on it a little bit. And that's not in an obsessive way. It's just talking about the omnipresence of our life. But as you continue on in Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting specifically in verse 16, he talks about the necessity of obedience. Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting verse 16, he says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, as you tested him at Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies, the statutes he has commanded you. You shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, and that you may go in and possess the good land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers, by driving out all your enemies from before you, as the Lord has spoken. Obedience is paramount. But here's the question, as you look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 as a whole. How can I obey the commandments of God if I don't know what they are? How can I know what God wants concerning this subject if I haven't even cracked my Bible open in six months? How can I know what God says in the book of Matthew if I skip every single week of the quarter that we discussed Matthew, for example? How can I follow God's commandments if I don't know what they are? And Paul makes the exact same argument in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 17, when he says, How can they hear unless people are sent? People cannot obey unless they're told, or unless they're taught from the scriptures what to do in order to obey. As you crash down to this, in verse 20, he then talks about the intergenerational nature of obedience. Look in verse 20 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. He says, When your son asks you in time to come, saying, What do the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments mean which the Lord our God commanded you? Which those questions will always arise. No matter if you've been, whether you've never attended Bible class, whether you've always attended Bible class, those questions will come up. What do the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments mean which the Lord our God commanded you? You then shall say to your son, We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. The Lord brought us up from Egypt with a mighty hand. Moreover, the Lord showed great and distressing signs and wonders before our eyes against Egypt. Pharaoh and all his household, he brought us out from there in order to bring us in, to give us the land which he had sworn to our fathers. So the Lord commanded us then to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, for our survival as it is today. It will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God, just as he commanded to us. There is going to come a time, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very specific application to parenting. There will come a time where your kids will ask you, why do we go to Bible class? Why do we go to worship on Wednesday night? None of my friends go to worship on Wednesday night. Why do we have worship service on Sunday morning that lasts what feels like, like 12 hours? Why do we have that? I'd much rather be sitting at home playing my video games. Don't get me started on how much I hate Fortnite, by the way. But I'd much rather stay at home, and I'd rather do that instead of being here. And the answer to that question, as Deuteronomy 6 lays out, is it's important to us because we know what God has done for us. Bible study is not some arbitrary rule set that we just kind of have you know, twice a week where we check it off and we show up in front of God and if we have a 70% attendance rate, boom, we're into heaven. That's not what Bible study is about. And it's also not something that is optional. And I've heard that from people, that it's just something that God doesn't necessarily mandate and so we don't really have to do it because it's not scripturally authorized, for lack of a better phrase, even though you can see the scriptural authorization all over the place. We don't partake of the Lord's Supper, so it's not really important for me to come. I'll tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, if that is your attitude towards Bible study, you are gravely mistaken. And I humbly and respectfully beg you to change your life. When you look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, you notice the intergenerational nature of obedience, the intergenerational nature of relationship to God, all of it comes into play. And I have seen people, in even my short life, I know there are people here who have seen thousands more examples of people that don't make Bible classes a priority. They excuse it for whatever reason. They feel like it. And then 15 years later, they wonder why their kid goes off to college and is not attending anywhere. Why is it important? Well, it wasn't important to you 15 years ago. And by your actions, you thought that that's not important now. And so intergenerational obedience is important. What you're doing now communicates to your children what's important in life. And so if 630 rolls around on this night, you say to yourself, well, we don't have to go because it's not authorized, it's not important, we're just studying the same old things we always have. What you're teaching your children, what I'm teaching my children, is that it's not important to study God's Word. It's not important to dive into the Scriptures. It's not important to discuss what it is that God wants us to know. This morning, I want to give you three reasons. I didn't have the space to put three great reasons on the back because of on that piece of paper back there. But I want to give you three great reasons why you need to be a part of this. Not just Sunday morning, not just Wednesday night, but every time the doors are open. And this can extend to even devos that we may have in people's houses, gospel meetings, all those different types of things. But three great reasons why it's necessary to attend all of us. And I'll start with the first one. The first one is, is that it sets the foundation. 
All of us know Matthew chapter 7. We know the end of it where he talks about setting your house on the rock and setting your house on the sand. The, the, the catastrophe that falls one of those people. And the teaching there from Matthew chapter 7 is build your house on the rock. Because if you build your foundation on something that stands, then you too will also stand the test of time. I have told, I have seen this thousands of times. I say thousands of times like I've been around for thousands of years. I've seen this more often than I care to admit. Where people will come in here and they'll visit the church for a couple of times. And we don't know where they came from. There's nothing that we have in common with another religious background. Look at many of those stay for a couple of times. And then they'll leave. They'll go somewhere else. And I'll run into them at Walmart or the Brandon Taco Bell, which apparently I frequent both times a week, according to what Howard thinks about me. But we run into them somewhere else, and they'll say, oh, I'm a member of this church. And then you start talking to them about their religious history. And they've been here, they've been here, they've been here, they've been here, they've been here. And basically, they have an every three-month or every six-month timetable at every different church. And the reason for that is very obvious. It's because there's no foundation. They don't even know what they're looking for. They wouldn't know truth because they're not smart enough to understand it. It's because that's not what they're looking for. They're not looking for truth. They're looking for what's sensational. They're looking for what's exciting. They're look, looking for what grips their attention. And we have had people that were formerly members here leave because of that very reason. There's nothing new. There's nothing exciting. I'm sorry to tell you the Bible's 2,000 years old. I'm sorry that's not exciting enough for you. But we have people that have left because there's no foundation there. And you see this in Acts chapter 17. If you look at Acts chapter 17, which you don't have to right now, but if you look at Acts chapter 17, you see this attitude with the philosophers. The people who sat there literally doing nothing else every single day. Except discussing what the latest and greatest philosophy was. What the newest idea out there was. What the newest sensational thing out there was. And because of that, there's no foundation for them. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to have a foundation in our life. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul discusses the necessity of a foundation for these people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 10, listen to what he says here, starting in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and others building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. And that's and they, and that's a commandment for us in today's world, just as it was 2,000 years ago. Each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds in the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show when it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If every man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. But if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. The key idea within 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is laid out there in verses 10 through 12 when he discusses the fact that the only true foundation we can have, ladies and gentlemen, is Christ. If we're building our understanding of religion off of Hinduism, off of Buddhism, or off of whatever Brady wants is on, if that's what we're building our philosophies on, then it will find itself to be completely deprecated. When any ounce of trial begins to show up. The secondary point that he makes there in verse 15, chapter 3 is, it not only matters what the foundation is, it matters what you build on top of that. It matters, once I understand that Jesus is the foundation, it matters how I assemble my house. Do I dedicate myself to God? Do I implant my own personal opinions in it? Do I make excuses about things? Do I read in my own biases in the scripture? How do I build on that foundation, which is Christ? And that's the key idea there, the secondary key idea within this passage. Because in the day of trial, what we think about Christ is important. Persecution has the ability to either tear us completely apart, or has the ability, as he mentions there, verses 14 through 15, to show the evidence of our faith. That's what persecution does. And Bible study, ladies and gentlemen, exemplifies that. It shows the fact that I am dedicated to making my foundation strong. First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 6. Paul writes to the young evangelist in 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 6. And pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following, but have nothing to do with worldly fables, fit only for, good, or for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Now listen to this. Verse 8, for bodily discipline is only a little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things. I've been guilty of taking that to the extreme, as you can tell by my ever-expanding waistline sometimes. Bodily discipline is only a little profit, 
But godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for a present life and also for the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement. By the way, when Paul says that phrase, it is a trustworthy statement, it would, it would behoove you to focus in on what he's saying. He says it several times, but especially these two letters to Timothy. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. For it is this, it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. What does he say in 1 Timothy chapter 4? Verses 6 through 7 and 8, what he says is, don't fix your foundation on old worldly fables and things that don't matter in this life. Things that are entertaining, things that are fun, but don't really do anything. And he says in verse 10, our hope and our fixation should be on Jesus Christ. It should govern everything. Not to say that we can't have lives. That's not to say that you can't have jobs, that we can't have hobbies, that we can't have relaxation, we can't have me time. That's not the point. The point that he says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10 is the focal point of our life, everything that we gear our lives towards, should be Jesus Christ. And when we begin to make excuses that separate us from him, we might need to do some soul searching. I'm putting myself at the forefront of that. Some people would skip Bible classes because they think they're unnecessary. If you've been a member of the church for any number of years, you probably know the basics by now. Be baptized, don't cuss, and whatever you do, don't offend Joe because he'll make fun of you in Bible class. Those are the basics of salvation. Wow, that didn't get any kind of response. Whatsoever. I think people are actually worried that they could offend Joe. Those are the basics. And so when people think to themselves, well, I don't need to attend Bible class because I know the book of Matthew, I know the book of John, these things. That's true. And there are people in this auditorium right now who have a far greater understanding of Scripture than I do. And that's a testament to you and your own personal study and your own devotion to Christ. But I'll tell you right now that understanding the basics is not enough. Look at John chapter 17. And Jesus' high priestly prayer that he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. He opens up this whole thing in John chapter 17 by talking about his pleas that he has for people, what he wants from us. In John chapter 17, starting in verse 1. Jesus spoke these things, lifting his eyes up to heaven. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. So he's talking about his followers. He's talking about the people specifically that he has been given. Verse 3. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Let me ask you something right now. Do you know God? Do I know God? Do you truly know God? Notice what I'm not asking. What I'm not asking is, do you know things about God? I'm not asking if you know that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he was resurrected on the third day, that he commands baptism. I'm not asking that. What I'm asking is, do you know God? Do you spend time prayerfully talking to him? Do you read the scriptures meditating on what he wants us to know? Do we think about Him? Do we have any kind of a relationship with Him that's formed out of obedience? <clears throat> or can we just siphon off next? Can we just say this and that and this and that? And, and we'd be great at Bible trivia, but we don't really know who God is. That was Jesus' plea in John chapter 17. Not just that we would know Him, but that we would know Him. There's an intimacy there. The lack of knowledge is what ultimately destroyed the people. If you look back in Hosea chapter 4, which is probably the passage everybody's been thinking about, or some people have been but if you look at Hosea chapter 4, the big penultimate verse every time we discuss this concept, Hosea chapter 4, starting in verse 6, actually just verse 6 for now, we'll back up a second. But in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, this is the passage that everyone thinks about when we talk about the importance of Bible study. Okay, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you for being my priest. Now, when you look at Hosea chapter 4, and you take a step back, and you look at what the chapter's talking about, he's addressing religious leaders. You can't get around that. And so there are some people who would say, well, none of Hosea 4 applies to me, because I'm not a Levitical priest. And that is true to a certain extent. And then you look at 1 Peter, and he talks about us being a spiritual priesthood, and then you all kind of, we all just kind of get back and check with it. But when you look at Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, the ultimate argument that he makes is the lack of knowledge and understanding of me and your people is what's leading to your destruction. And that's not to say, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, once again, that Israel's people lost Bible trivia. It's not what he's arguing against. The fact that these people couldn't necessarily identify Abraham from Moses, well, that would be a huge problem. That's not necessarily the problem. Because when you look at Hosea chapter 4, starting in verse 1, listen to what he says leading up to that. 
He says, listen to the word of the Lord, the sons of Israel, for the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of Israel, because there is no faithfulness, no kindness, or no knowledge of God in the land. There is, however, verse 2, swearing, deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. They employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore the land mourns, and everyone who lives in it languishes, along with the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, and also the fish of the sea disappear. Yet let no one find fault, but none offer reproof. For your people are like those who contend with the priest, even the ones who are saying the right thing, you contend with them. Verse 5, so you will stumble by day, the prophet also will stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. That's a genealogical metaphor. When you look at Hosea chapter 4, verses especially 2 and 3, the wickedness in the land is so pervasive that it should not even be mentioned among the children of Israel. And yet, where does all that come from? When you look at verse 6, that's where it comes from. My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge, because of a lack of understanding of God's will that's led them basically to do whatever it is that they want to. Ladies and gentlemen, Bible study, Bible reading, Bible Whatever, focus, that's the word I was looking for, gives us an understanding and builds us a foundation for our life that we can build off of. When I'm faced with a conundrum on Tuesday about whether or not I'm going to cheat on my taxes, by the way, my taxes are already well, thank you, Ken. But if I'm going to face a conundrum on Tuesday about whether or not I'm going to lie on my taxes, or when I face a conundrum on Thursday when I see a cop and I'm speeding and I'm going to try to get down some neighborhoods to get away from them, when I face those types of real life decisions of which these types were the things that we're guilty of. And I'll obviously a lot more. That foundation I have through Bible study teaches me that those things are wrong. And even more so, when I approach somebody who I know needs to hear the gospel, that understanding of Bible study is what gives me confidence to approach them. I say this, what happens if they say that? I've heard countless people tell me, I've been guilty of this as well. I can't talk to people about the gospel because I don't know enough. And that may be very well be true. I'll tell you right now, if you know a fraction of what you might know, or what you think you know, you probably know enough. We all know enough. But if you don't feel like you know enough, Bible study and Bible classes are a perfect time to expand your knowledge and expand our understanding of Scripture. It's this lack of foundation when you look at Hebrews chapter 5. It's this lack of foundation that the Hebrew writer just blocked out completely. I would love to talk to you about more things he says in Hebrews chapter 5, but I can't because you people don't even understand the basics. Hebrews chapter 5, starting in verse 11. He's talking about Melchizedek, who was always one of the greatest in the of Scripture. Even the things we know about him still just, for whatever reason, makes him more mysterious to us. And in Hebrews chapter 5, starting verse 11, he says, Concerning him, Melchizedek, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you have become to old hearing. For though by this time you want to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern between good and evil. The Hebrew writer says in this passage, I would love to talk to you about this other stuff, but I can't. Because even though at this point in your life you should know more, you just simply don't. And all the excuses and all the rationale and all the this and all the that and all the whatnot, none of that escapes the fact that by this time, he says in Hebrew chapter 5, you should be teaching me almost. But you don't know anything. That's so why when we talk about elders and talk about the elder process, the idea of a new convert is not just relegated to age. There are people that are in their 70s, 80s, 90s, hundreds I've seen that are relatively new converts in their terms of their understanding of Scripture and not compared to anybody else. But these are people that have been in the church for 70 plus years and can't defend baptism to you. That's a problem. That's a problem if that exists within me. It's a problem that exists within anybody. And so what Bible study does is it gives us the proper foundation, but it also allows us to build on that foundation. It allows us to go deeper into things. We get to discuss things as a group and see the Bible comprehensively from a bigger perspective rather than just piecemeal. If you're studying your Bible for whatever reason, and this is a great thing, by the way, but if you happen to be up at 2 in the morning and you're studying your Bible and you're reading, I don't know, you're reading in those areas, and you read this and you think to yourself, well, what does that mean? By all reasons, I would encourage you at 2 a.m. to call Paul and Shell. And now Cody, I get to pick on him as well. I would encourage you to call those three men at 2 a.m. Anytime between 10 and 5. You can call them and ask them what it is. But most of us can't do that. We can't just look to our neighbor. We can't just look to the side. We can't raise our hand. We can't teach a class in which we get to go into that further. But ladies and gentlemen, we get to in Bible study. If you have a question concerning a period of text, you get to raise your hand, or in some cases, like Howard, you don't even raise your hand, you just say it. And we get to discuss it, which is fine, by the way. But 
But that's why when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and Paul talks about this exact same thing we just mentioned, he utters the inescapable <coughs> phrase, I planted, Apollos watered, it was God who gave the increase. God does give the increase. But someone has to plant and someone has to water. And just because we went through Matthew once, just because we went through Matthew three times, doesn't mean that we can't go through Matthew the tenth time. The Bible is one of those things that is, is the more you go through it, the more I go through it, the more questions I have that we have. The more I seek to understand things about it. It's one of those rare books that does that to you. I would say it's probably the only book that does that to you. The more we dive into it, the more we want to dive into it. Most of you know that a few years ago I went back to school for graduate work, and it was, it was an incredibly enlightening period of my life, and it was, it was hectic for every sense of the word. It was one of those times periods that really stretched me. And so some of you may have known that, but what most of you probably don't know is that when I went back to, when I was in my undergrad, when I was at SFA, I almost failed every single one of my history classes. I think my GPA in those history classes was like a 2.1. I barely skated by, even though I loved it. And a ton of reasons for why I almost failed them, none of which are good. They're all completely excuses. But when I was discussing this with my grad school advisor, when I was talking to them, I asked her, and I'll never forget this, I said, what is the difference between an undergrad degree in history and a, a graduate degree in history? I'll never forget what she told me. She said, in your undergrad degree, you discuss facts. You discuss data. You discuss things, which I probably had to catch up on greatly. But you discuss data, you discuss facts, things, events, timelines, those types of hard data. But in grad school, that's when you begin to put it all together. And you discuss themes, and you can discuss the Civil War beyond just the regular narratives. You discuss the women's suffrage movement beyond greater narratives. And by the way, that's not something, I don't think that's just specific to history. I think that's the thing that happens anytime you go more in-depth into a subject. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what we want to do with Bible class. Those of you who are in our Wednesday night class on Acts hopefully have seen this at this point, that we are not discussing the 12 different examples of baptism. We know those things. You know those things. We're not discussing Acts chapter 2 and the Greek word of baptizo and the Greek word ice and all those different things. That's not what we're discussing. Because what we're discussing in the book of Acts, a book that probably all of us have studied hundreds of times, is the themes. What do you see in this chapter that's prevalent in the entire world? How can we go into Acts chapter 18 in view of the book as a whole? That's what we should, ladies and gentlemen, be doing. That's how we should grow. In Ephesians chapter 4, as Paul talks about the unity, he discusses that very early in the book of Acts. But he builds on this unity, discusses unity and what our goal is as a group, as a collective group. And in Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, listen to what he says here, starting in verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11, listen to what he has to say here. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11, he says, He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers, and all these gifts, by the way, these things, these offices, are for one purpose. Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. That's the reason these different offices exist, these different things exist. Verse 13, for until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, verse 14, this goes back to that foundation, as a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by ways, carried out by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, verse 15, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Ladies and gentlemen, we grow best when we grow together. And if you're not here, I miss you. If you're not here, growth is stunted. If I'm not here, my growth is stunted. Because as he mentions here in Ephesians chapter 11, verses, or chapter 4, verses 11, down to verse 16, growth happens when we grow together. We study things together. We work together. And the equipping of the saints that he mentions there, specifically in verse 12, that's my goal. My prayer every time I stand before anybody is that by the time you leave here, you will feel even a little bit more equipped <coughs> to handle the world, to study the Bible. That's my goal. <coughs> That should be. I, I know it is. I should do this like that. I know it is the elders' goal. I know that's Brad's goal. Whoever's leading, singing. I know that's the Bible class teacher's goal. That's our goal. Is that you feel more equipped every single time 
when you're in this building. If you don't feel welcome, I would please beg you to talk to me, talk to the others, talk to the deacons, talk to anybody, talk to Jason for all I care. Talk to somebody. And Jason's a great guy, by the way. Talk to somebody about how we can better equip each other. As 1st 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 talks about, we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord God. Titus chapter 3, verse 1, we need to be ready for every good work. That growth happens here. But when he says in this passage in Ephesians chapter 4 that these things cause growth, he's talking about that unity. And as he mentions in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, by studying the scriptures, by looking into and pouring over God's word, we can begin to rightly divide the text and see what it means, see what it talks about, and see its application for modern day world. This is the last, last great reason. But you didn't see that one coming. It's fun. I've told people, I don't broadcast it, I guess I am now, but I, I've told people in the past, I would rather preach honor Bible classes to every sermon. And that's not because I don't like preaching. I do enjoy the lots. But I love Bible classes. I love the give and take. I love the conversation. I love the spontaneity of it. I love the ability to go into a class and to have studied something, and then even myself to come out of that class ten times more edified than I went into it. Because somebody said something that I've never thought about before. And it's that group knowledge, that group teaching, that group understanding. That's what I love the most about Scripture. I know some people get apprehensive. Some people don't like talking about the class. Some people are afraid that they'll say the wrong answer. And I'll tell you right now, unless your name is Nathan and Joe, you will never say the wrong answer to my class. Because I will always do my best to try and make it feel inclusive. And that's the way that it should be. To find, try and find a way, even if something is completely dead wrong, at least use it in a way that's constructed and to bring all of us together. I'll tell you this much, though. You get out of it what you put into it. You get out of Bible class what you put into it. And if you walk into a Bible class like the Jews did in John chapter 5, verse 39, where Jesus says, you search the scriptures looking for me, and they're telling you about me, you're trying to read into the scriptures something, you don't come out of it completely bored. And you won't come into it learning anything. <laughs> if you go after it like the Bereans did in Acts the 16th chapter, if you look at the scriptures, trying to see whether these things are so, analyzing the text, looking at it, growing, then I guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, you will come out of it. A lot of people look at a Bible class, for instance, on the book of Ezekiel and think, well, Ezekiel's boring. I'll tell you right now, if you ever study Ezekiel, it is not boring. In the least. Because what you have is very, very vivid imagery, coupled with very, very real historic illusions, applied to today's world. It is not boring. Let me tell you when it gets boring. It's when you show up in week eight of a Bible class, and you start walking into the book of Ezekiel, and we're talking about wheels spinning, we're talking about people making campfires out of weird things, and we start talking about angels as that's when it gets boring, because we have no idea what's going on. And then we do what everybody does. By the way, I see everybody. Even if you think I don't see you, I see you. So what we inevitably do when it comes like that is we check out, we get on Facebook, we scroll, we scroll, we scroll, we look up, still boring, scroll, 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 and before long we don't want to be about the festival. But we're not putting anything into it. And because we're not putting anything into it, ladies and gentlemen, we're not getting anything out of it. We also realize how good it can be for us. And I don't mean just in a, a good for us because it's fun. I mean it's good for us in a way that eating right and exercising are good for us. Now, that spawned an instant hatred in your mind towards Bible study. I apologize. But I'll tell you right now that the older I get, I don't know why I'm making so many age illusions. The older I get, ladies and gentlemen, the more I realize how important Bible knowledge is and Bible study is. Because someday, as we talked about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, someday we will all stand here. And we will give an account to him for our lives. And the question won't be, did you become CEO? Did you get that big promotion? Did you get that yacht? Were you happy? Not even those questions. The question will be, did you obey me? That's the most important question of all. And the only way, ladies and gentlemen, as we mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 6, that I can answer that is my Bible study. And seeing whether or not I am, as he mentions in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, if I'm not in the faith. W.C. Fields, who was one of the 20th century, the earliest 20th century's greatest comedic voices. He wasn't a great guy, apparently. Had a real problem with sexual temptation, alcoholism, all those different things. He was known as not being a Christian. And W.C. Fields died in 1946, and shortly before one of his, or before his death, one of his friends walked up and asked him, because he saw him rifling through a Bible right before he died. And he asked W.C. Fields, what is it that you're doing? Why are you looking through a Bible you never cared about before? And W.C. Fields said, I'm looking for loopholes. Now, I don't try to tell you right now that you need to be a Bible study because you need to look for loopholes. There aren't any in there. At least to my knowledge, 
Somebody else can show me something, but there's not loopholes in the Bible. But what I can tell you is the closer we approach that, the older we get, the more and more we realize how we're, how we're living according to the scriptures of history. We understand that our lives are born. We understand that we won't be here forever. And we need to start planning for that eternal state, for that eternal home that we'll have. It's like this too. We need to study different things. Jumping back to our Ezekiel study, I, don't, I would do a show of hands at this point, but I've already gone a little bit over. But I would love to know how many people in this building right now have ever thought to themselves, A, I need to study my Bible more, and B, I'm going to jump into Ezekiel. I, I don't do that, do you? I don't know many people that say to themselves, I need to study my Bible more, so I'm going to go study one of the hardest books in the Bible out of nowhere. I don't do that. It's spiritual suicide, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, because we'll get confused. We don't understand what's going on. It's hard. When we come together in Bible class, when we get together, we get to discuss things that we never get to discuss before. We make illusions. We make parallels. We make applications we've never gotten to see before. I'll tell you this much right now. If you are here for those classes, whatever it is that we started in Ezekiel, I've, for some reason, trumpeted that up. We're not discussing it anytime soon, and I know about it. But when we discuss Ezekiel, I guarantee you, whether it's three months or whether it's six months, we will study it, and we will finish it. We will get to the end of that study, and by the end of that study, you will think to yourself, I know a little bit more about Ezekiel now than beforehand. Because none of us, let's be honest, would ever just open the Bible up and just study that book out of everything. That's what we get when we come to Bible study. It may be, ladies and gentlemen, that we don't go to Bible class sometimes because we're afraid that Bible class will expose our lack of spiritual understanding. We can hide in worship sometimes. It's easy for us to come in when worship starts and just kind of sit there at the back when they're doing the announcements. Nobody sees us and we can kind of skate out. It's good for us to get our spiritual credit in when we just show up to worship. But when we come from Bible class, and I do, like I do 12 times every class for whatever reason, any thoughts or comments, and I've sat there for 30 years silent. Not because I'm afraid, because I don't know the answer. I've never known the answer. And maybe what that reveals about me is it exposes my own spiritual lack of understanding. But here's the bright news of it, the bright side of all of it. You can grow. Every time we study together, it's an opportunity to grow. Every time we crack open the Bible, it's an opportunity to know more about God's Word than we did when we got it. And that's what we need to realize about Bible study. James chapter 4, verse 8 says very simply, draw near to God, and I will draw near to you. The simple truth of it, ladies and gentlemen, is that we make time for what we want to make time. We can make time for hobbies, we can make time for our job, we can make time for our families, and we should make time for those things. But if Bible class isn't important, you won't make time for it. You won't care about it. You won't want to be there, because it's not important to you. I would encourage everyone here this morning to ask themselves, what do I sacrifice in my life? What events, what groups of people, what are those things that I sacrifice in my life? What are the things that are expected? And if Bible class is one of those things that is I would encourage you to rethink that, and to rethink your attitude towards that. I realize that this morning hasn't been necessarily off hours of rainbow. I can see looking out that I've offended a couple people. I may have offended, otherwise that's just your natural scowl, which is totally different. But it may be that I've offended some people. And I'll be honest with you, I don't mind that. Because I believe that what we've talked about this morning is the truth. I believe that what we're talking about is scripturally accurate. That it is important for us to be a Bible class. And there's not an attendance chart that shows that. But my own personal desire to know more about God's work and to be with God's people should be reflected. In that. And ladies and gentlemen, that's why I'm not going to apologize. And that's why I will hopefully strive to do better in every one of my life aspects as well. We also haven't talked about what it takes to become a child of God, but I'll tell you that if you know enough to become a child of God, you don't have to study that much. You'll need to know that God is one, that He is real, that He is active, and that He sent His Son to die on the cross for us, our sins. And that by living a life of obedience to Him, by being baptized into His death, we can rise and walk into His life. That's what you need to know. We can take care of that for you right now. Won't you come with us?